Gospel reading is from Matthew 15, verse 21. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Here ends the reading. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. James Kittleson was son, father, brother, grandfather, husband, friend, but also, and he could not deny it, doctor of the church. No doubt he would correct me on that. Church must at least be plural. <laughs> and of if possessive, would have to be only the head, Jesus Christ. And at best, the church is mentioned as the object of service. Then history must be there as well. So perhaps more correctly, doctor, belonging to Christ, unto the churches, concerning their often forgotten history. <laughs> History that dare not be fictionalized, but set out as it really was. But with so many qualifications, Jim would say, that's as awkward as a pregnant duck. <laughs> so we'll just say vocation, hearer of souls. As he normally described a vocation, he was God's creature, who did what was at hand to do as the day gave opportunity and out of the serendipity, as he liked to say, of the Holy Spirit's work with ordinary creatures, extraordinary things come. So, Dr. Kittleson, putting one foot before the other on a slow and plodding race, found his name at the bottom of a great Luther book, A History of the Reformation in Strasbourg, and Controversies and Edification for the Churches for whomever has ears to hear. But it was his great and hard battles, as Luther once put it, to rend from Christ a word of blessing that causes me to take up this text for preaching. You need a blessing that applies directly to you, that strengthens as death draws near. Dr. Kittleson often told his students there's nothing like nearly dying three times to improve your theology. <laughs> he wanted the unvarnished truth and plain words. Satis est, it is enough, means it is enough. When Christ said, this is my body given for you, he meant this is my body given for you. When he said, I come not for the well, but for the sick, he meant not the well, but the sick. <laughs> this is not rocket science. <laughs> but who has believed him? The one who holds Christ to his word, traps Christ there until he blesses you. That's who. Blessings in life are hard to come by. You recall Jacob and Esau. You seek and take them where you can. Since you can't bless yourself, though God knows you try. 
When blessings are given, they honor, include you, and bestow benefits, and so they only matter to come from someone whom you already love and admire and need. So a mother says to her daughter, you have become the woman I always hoped you would be. A teacher says to his pupil, I doff my cap to you, you will become my better. It is true, withholding such blessings can motivate you for a time. Much of the art of teaching is just that, <laughs> holding back, holding back at just the right time between despair and pride, bestowing the blessing. Well done, good and faithful servant, or at least adequate. <laughs> Any teacher knows how to withhold a blessing, especially one nicknamed by his crowning glory graduate students, the Big Cuddly. <laughs> Teaching is mostly using the law in its first use to preserve and keep from sin. But withholding a blessing too long can also kill in this life and the next. Nothing is more sure to cook up despair than you holding back too long with that blessing. Yet for all that, Christ has quite a different problem than mothers and teachers. He has his own great and hard battle to wage. As hard as human blessings are to get in this life, just try giving a divine blessing once. Christ has the job of giving out blessings to you who don't think you need them. Time is what I need, not Christ. A few more ticks of the clock and an extended health care plan. So it is, giving a blessing to people who think they don't need it turns out to be the hardest battle of them all. Jesus Christ came down from on high, loaded with blessings. He had just finished hearing the pious of Israel recite their interesting theory that they can keep themselves pure by minding what they put in their mouths. One never knows when something coming from the outside might pollute you, after all. And Jesus tried right then and there to give them a blessing. Nothing, he said, from outside pollutes. It is what comes from inside, through your mouth, to the outside that pollutes. But no takers. Inner purity must defend itself from external attack, even from a blessing from Christ. Then suddenly Jesus ran away from Galilee's pious Mark says, in order to hide, you preachers know why. My goodness, you can hardly give Christ away these days for free. <coughs> His blessing is so short and so sweet. I forgive your sin. But who wants such a blessing from the outside? So you preach the words and duck. You plant the seed and run. Wasn't it only two weeks ago that Jim sat in a wheelchair, yellow with jaundice, and preached to us with this text, in the middle of life, we are already in death. So the order of death to those who think they are living followed Christ into old Canaan land. But so did the sweet smell of the gospel to those who are perishing. He couldn't get rid of it. The Syrophoenician woman, the Canaanite woman, with a sick child, came with her sack open wide, begging Christ for what she needed. My daughter, lying on her bed at home, has a demon. Have mercy, Lord, son of David. So began her first battle, to beg, to worship. The living don't need mercy from an unknown Lord. The dying, however, do. But so at the same time, Christ's battle begins. 
He is the one, rightly enough, who has filled scripture with Mary's song. The hungry he hath filled with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He has come, in fact, to the world that we might have life and have it abundantly. But what does this preacher do? This great bestower of blessing. He hides and withholds. But he did not answer her a word, our text says. The one who came preaching, the one who shuts up Pharisees and Sadducees alike, the very one of whom it is said, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written if every deed and sermon were inscribed therein. That one said nothing to the woman. So what was she to think? <coughs> it was worth a try. Now I go back to the way things were, wiping my child down in bed, watching her suffer, finally to be relieved of this pain only by her dying and leaving me. Is that what she is to say? But she persisted, seeing a mask in Christ in which she was sure he was hiding, withholding his blessing, but nevertheless having a blessing in there worth getting. She wanted what was in that dumb mask. Faith persisted. But what about the words that had already spilled out from Galilee? Comfort, comfort ye my people. The lame will walk, the blind will see, the dead will be raised. Will he let those be false words? So she began shouting at the disciples, God only knows what, until they asked Jesus to use his mouth, not to speak for her, but to speak against her. Send her away, they said, for she keeps shouting at us, as if disciples could do something. They, were, they too were getting tainted with the aroma of the gospel and its distinct attraction to the dying. Who wants to wear perfume for the infirm. So, Jesus spoke to his disciples by reciting his mission statement. I was sent for the lost sheep of Israel. Though where that flock of sheep was gathered around him was anyone's guess. The irony might have been lost on the disciples, but the woman overheard the gospel again. And she came up kneeling at his feet a second time. Lord, help me right here, right now, this person standing in front of you. Now there is a prayer if ever Jesus had heard one. He is the one, after all, who taught his own disciples to pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. And it was him, the self-same, who said, if two of you shall agree on earth, whatsoever they ask, it shall be done for them. But now he adds insult to injury. I hear all prayers from my Israel, but not yours. It seems unholy, unholy to behold how he creates faith, to watch this hunter hunting, and to hear this woman run her race until her dying breath, clinging to his words, which she only had secondhand. If you trust your own inner feeling at this time, you would have to let go of the word. That word was spoken to someone else, not you, Jesus says. How much more blunt can he be? <coughs> you overheard but the gospel does not apply to you. Yet all she can hear is that at least he's speaking now. The mass broke its silence. So her second and great hard battle began. Couldn't Christ have left it at that, the woman submitting herself? Shouldn't monastic humility be enough, O Lord? What more do you want? For the first time, he then speaks to her, to her directly, but as if she isn't even there. 
It is not right, not justified, to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. The last mortal blow, her third and final battle, condemned, outcast, not only not blessed, but cursed. It is not right to throw a promise to an undeserving dog. Why would Jesus do this? Surely this blot on Jesus' clean record as a kind and gentle savior rests on Jesus himself. If he is going to save anyone, it will not be by being holy, but by becoming a curse, a hunter for exercising faith, cooking and roasting his sins. Now behold, the Canaanite woman does an unheard of thing with a curse. She did with a curse what even the pious of Israel refused to do with a blessing. She agreed. She takes his no and calls herself by his name. So it is, I am a dog. But even the dogs eat scraps from the master's table. She doesn't despair, she comes alive. For she at least now has words of her own from him, the Lord, the very Lord, who was becoming sinner, the greatest of sinners, sin itself even for her. There is, as Luther once said about Christ's word at this place, more yea in them than nay. There is only yes in them but it is very deep and very concealed, where there appears to be nothing but no. What do you do with Christ's no? Just what the Canaanite woman did. Twist out a blessing from him by giving him no choice. Even the dogs get crumbs, she says. That is how you trap Christ, how you make him your savior, rather than always someone else's. You take him at his word and find him just even when he condemns you. But this was even more a great and hard battle for Christ. You can almost hear how his heart cracked open for the woman and out spilled his cooped up blessings that no one seemed to want. O oh, woman, great is your faith. Your prayer is answered. So it is that Christ rejoices at such faith. Finally, finally, I've escaped from the holy and I've got a sinner. Finally, someone on earth who wants my blessing. So his blessings poured out in a flood. The child that had the demon had it removed. The woman has her blessing and it is the very thing that makes her right with the Father himself, who created her after all. So now you, learn to go against feeling and reason and hold to Christ. Hold Christ to his word, for Christ's blessing is to save sinners. Look it up, 1 Timothy 15, I didn't make it up, <laughs> to save sinners. You say, for in this word, I catch you in your judgment, O Christ. I am a sinner, unworthy of you or your death, and so I claim the promise you made to save sinners. No gender, no race, no religion attached. You, Christ, are always right in your judgments, are you not? What's wrong, O Lord? Am I not enough of a sinner for you? <laughs> Touche, Christ answers. How he enjoys coming to this end, this defeat at your hands. He loves succumbing to you when you recite his words back to him. So you must become a sinner before Christ. Refusing to become a sinner means you are one. This is why Jim preached as he did his last public sermon using the old medieval hymn. In the middle of life, you are already in death. But 
than putting Luther's own twist on the tune. Thanks be to Christ, who came down to us with his blessing. In the middle of death, you are already in life. Grab God by his word and never let go. Christ loves to succumb to you in this word. It is right for him so to do. Well then, you need his words for you. Enough withholding. I'm going to do what a preacher does. Give your blessing and duck. In Christ, your own sin is forgiven indeed. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. So, if they should take your house, goods, fame, child, or spouse, if life itself be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. One little word will fail him. Hoist Christ on his own petard and use his words against him. Thou sayest, I, sinner, chosen by you, justifying God. That is satis est. That is enough. Jesus Christ loves that about you. For then you have already learned to scowl like a true doctor of the church, like the big cuddly, and speak right to your final enemy. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Your blessing now is not complicated. It is simplicity itself. Sinner, on account of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ, he conquered death for you. Your labor here is not in vain. Amen.